So I don't know if you guys uh, pay too much attention to the news. I I don't, uh, but for different reasons uh, than I didn't when I was 20. Um, but um, they're having some issues over in Dubai. And, um, well, they're flooding like crazy. Now, I don't know too much about this situation. Um, I'll admit that, and I'm not an expert um, on infrastructure by any means. But I do recall when they built this bit of land. Um, it's it's man-made. A good chunk of, um, I won't say the country, but the city, uh, the area, let's just say, was built in the 90s. Um, I'm guessing because of their location, more or less desert, um, they didn't really think too much about um, water management infrastructure, flood control, so on and so forth, because, you know, not really a concern. But now, and again, this is, I'm not sure if this is bordering on conspiracy theory. They're talking about cloud seeding, which typically doesn't work, but um, for whatever reason, and we'll, you know, we could throw out the specter of climate change. Who knows what's going on right now? But they got a whole hell of a lot of rain in very little time. And things are, you know, the airport's under three feet of water, for example, really hard for planes to go in and out and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, that's a fairly big hub for many, many, many things, let alone just all of the, you know, the, the horrible displacement and, and I'm not sure if there's been lives lost yet or not, but, um, you know, folks like us who are used to precipitation don't know how to drive through rain, etc., um, without swamping our cars and getting washed down the stream or the street. I'm sure folks who haven't really seen rain, um, you know, but once or twice a little spittle coming down, uh, aren't, aren't super experienced either. So, so Lord only knows what's, what's happening there. Um, but uh, it ain't great. And, you know, that ties in a large part with what we've been talking about here. When I talk to you guys about um, groundwater, we try to squeeze in some, um, some issues here or there that are, that are, you know, tangentially related, environmentally speaking. And, and, and as I'm thinking about it now, um, Did we finish the groundwater lecture? Yeah, because I did part two first, right? Yeah, so we did. You know, as I'm thinking about it, I'm not sure I gave you my little talk about the uh, folks with the uh, uh, the granite aquifers in Vermont and and stuff like that. And there, there's some environmental um, angles there. Um, certainly, when we talk about streams, which this semester we haven't done yet, um, the subject of flooding comes up. But again, even just existing in this world um, for the last 20 some odd years, you know, you hear things, especially if you live in or around South Utica, Whitesboro, um, they've had some, some flooding issues and, and everyone's, you know, got their reasons that they throw out there. So you don't live presumably in a vacuum. Um, but, uh, you know, the more we pave, the less water can go into the ground is a very, very simple equation. Um, and what ties that all together and where I traditionally start the water unit at um, is with the water cycle or the hydrologic cycle. So that's what we're going to talk about uh, today. All right. And uh, not to use someone else's uh, tragedy as a uh, segue, by any means, 
but um, certainly as a, a, a case study, I suppose, if we were in a, a psych or a social class, they might refer to it that way, um, of where it's kind of going horribly wrong. So. All right. So with that being said, Hydro, water, you know that one. All right, many applications where, many opportunities where you've used that word. Lo logic, lo logi, logos, ology, all right. Um, they're all derivatives of the same idea, the same word, um, and study of or knowledge of. Okay, you're in psychology, biology, geology, that, that ology means something. All right. So this is just our fancy college word for the water cycle, hydrologic cycle, study of how water cycles. So water is really neat. All right. It's really special. It's a compound. You should know that. Um, going back to our one of our very earliest lectures here. We learned what a compound was. Uh, H2O, pretty much everybody knows that as well. Most of you know that that means there's two hydrogens and an oxygen. When I was in school, when I was a kid, we used to hear like the Mickey Mouse molecule a lot because then the teachers, just to get you again, catch your eye, whatever, would draw it uh, a good bit differently than this, um, this drawing here. They'd make the H's much more prominent, you know, so they look like Mickey Mouse ears and, and so on and so forth. Um, and that's, you know, a teacher's job, catch your eye, get your interest, and it's sticking with me all these years later, so it must have worked. Um, but what you don't hear a lot about is uh, necessarily how it is uh, polarized, and uh, it has a positive side and a negative side. You learn about that in chemistry, perhaps, if you took it. Um, and what that it does, or the implications of that, is that um, we used the word phobic and philic the other day, right? Um, water itself is hydrophilic. Water loves to stick to other water molecules. And they daisy chain up the positives and negatives, positives and negatives, and they make these, you know, wonderful, you've heard of surface tension, right? That's because of this. It's cool. Little bugs could actually walk across the surface of water. Yeah, they're really tiny, and yeah, their 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 feet or their legs are really really tiny too. But all of that works because water loves to stick together so much. A lot of all of this works because water loves to stick together so much. But even more neat than that, I think, is that water is one of a few, if if not the only. I really need to fact check this one of these days. Um that exists under normal conditions at the surface of the earth in all three states of matter. That just doesn't happen that often, all right? Three states of matter, solid, liquid, gas, right? So we've got liquid, liquid water, obviously. Uh, solid, solid water we call ice. And gaseous water we call water vapor. And for all the pretty diagrams and everything else that we're going to throw at you, that's really all the water cycle is about, is how water goes from one state of matter to another uh, throughout the Earth, in and on and around the Earth. So, again, random little factoids you may or may not have heard over the years. Um, nearly three-quarters of the surface of the Earth is covered with water. You know and hopefully love it as the ocean. All right. Uh, which means the other roughly 30% of the Earth is land. Now, again, we're just throwing in some random vocabulary if you didn't. And until this point, know what terrestrial meant. Now's your chance. Okay. Um, terra firma. You've heard that maybe. 
extraterrestrial. Everyone hears that. That extra part means from, from with, uh, not from. Okay, uh, I want to say from without, but that uh, it's not the not the right word. I'm trying to grasp. Um, from outside of. Okay. Um, the oceans, aquatic environment, marine environment, a handful of ways they refer to that. But from our humanistic perspective, that water isn't horribly useful to us, ignoring all the wonderful things that grow on it that we love to eat. Okay. But as pure basic survival, salt water, no good. If you've ever got a mouthful of it, you, you know. So we're back to terrestrial now, and when we want to talk about our perspective of the hydrologic cycle, we want to talk about fresh water, and um, we've got this lovely little factoid here that of all the water on the planet, only 3% of it is usable water, again, what we call fresh water. And that 3% is tied up um, it's as surface water, lakes and streams, as groundwater, aquifers, and in ice, ice caps, glaciers, whatnot. Not on purpose, but I left one place out on this list where water lo loves to live. Um, where's that? Yeah, more general though. They're in the clouds for sure. They are the clouds. Clouds are water. The atmosphere. The atmosphere. All right. So surface water, groundwater, ice, and the atmosphere. And again, that's really what this hydrologic cycle is going to discuss because, you know, we, we, we do need to start somewhere and we will start in the oceans. Don't get me wrong. It's the largest source of water. You could just as easily start over any lake, though. But conversationally, we'll start over the oceans. But it's all about spreading around that, that fresh water. Now, depending on the semester, I sometimes talk about uh, sources of our planet's water. We do cosmology this semester. Do we talk about the Earth coming together, cyanobacteria, all that stuff? Yeah. Okay. So you guys had this conversation, but we'll remind you. As far as scientists feel right now, the source of the primary, I should say, source of the Earth's water uh, is something called outgassing. Outgassing is um, during a volcanic event, an eruption if you would, but it doesn't have to be a big pointy mountain. It could just be a, a, a fissure, the Earth cracking open kind of thing. But during a volcanic event, lots and lots and lots of gases escape, not just lava, okay? The primary gas, and you should know this already, the primary gas that comes out of a volcano is what? Water vapor, okay? By far. That's what that big, thick, billowing, smoke-looking stuff is. It's just all dirty with ash. Well, again, we're not talking about necessarily big, pointy mountains here spewing out stuff, but we're going way back, way, way, way back. And uh, I probably at the time gave you the example of, you know, picture a softball or a baseball with that wonderful red stitching on it that even looks like the earth cracking open, okay? So these giant fissures all over the planet just opened up and this water vapor came out. Uh, it went on up into the atmosphere, it condensed, it fell as rain, and oh my gosh, I'm talking about the water cycle already, okay? And, and it rained and rained and rained and rained so much that it filled up the oceans. And yeah, I know that's hard to picture. It's a lot to picture. But it had to come from somewhere. 
Additionally, we, they, talk about um, the comets and their input. Comets, as you know, are big old ice balls. And we used to get hit by comets a whole lot more than we currently do. Thank goodness. All right. It'd be really hard to establish civilizations and life and all that stuff if we were getting bombarded as, as frequently as we used to. And I cite simply looking up at the moon one clear night and see all those impact craters. Or Google a picture of Mercury. All right. Absolutely riddled with craters. And there's some cool tech nowadays that's allowing us to find more and more and more impact craters um, by certain signatures they leave with like LIDAR, ground penetrating radar, and, and stuff like that. It's really cool science. Um, basically, we've had a mixture of erasing and covering stuff up with, with sediment that's just buried most of ours. There's a few still around. But for the most part, you know, they, they've been erased or buried. Anywho, so we know we got hit a lot by comets, but now, especially now that we know what comet water looks like chemically, okay, it has a certain signature, if you would. Um, we just don't see the ratios there to, to, to say that it was a primary source, by, by all means, okay. Uh, going back to what we talked about with geologic time, by all means, this is um, an, an actual event. This is this is actualism. Um, we, we can't it, it discount it completely. We can't ignore it. So we have some comet water, comedic water, as I say. And I should be knocking on wood there when we said one-time event. Okay, it is certainly less frequency, less frequent um, now. But outgassing is still going on to this day. Again. Not to the levels that it once had, because even volcanism used to be a good bit more prevalent in the past. So that's where our water came from. Okay, uh, some of you know there's plenty of water in the Earth as well, um, tied up in a variety of different things. I, I think this uh, idea that comes around every so often about there being giant ocean pools of water in the Earth is a bit much. Um, not everyone's on that train yet. But uh, but certainly there's 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 plenty of hydrogen and plenty of oxygen uh, around. Okay. Um, just remember, you know, when you see this question, there's a cumulative final on here. Um, we talk about uh, what's the primary element in the atmosphere, what's the primary element in the Earth. In the atmosphere, it's it's not oxygen. It's important to us, but remember, it's nitrogen. In the Earth, it is oxygen. And just think of silica, okay, SiO4. There's four times as many oxygen in that formula as there is silicon in that formula. And that wouldn't even be possible, especially as being one of the primary components of the crust, right? Wouldn't even be possible if there wasn't so dang much oxygen there. So if you remember one, then you could use that to remember the other thing. Kind of neat. So 3% of the Earth's water. Luckily, we could fit that into more than a water bottle. But um, it's a great way to start an analogy here for us. Um, so we have your typical bottle of water. And um, of that 3% of water that we, uh, we have on the Earth there, you can see how very little of that, uh, or how, how little that really is, I guess. This is a great way to show that. Um, Brine, okay, if you're not uh, sure what the TPT is, that's parts per thousand. So you have a thousand um, pieces of molecules of whatever word you want to use of something you're going to call water. Uh, more than 50 parts of that thousand, if it's salt, we call that brine. And that's actually pretty heavy. That's like Dead Sea or uh, Salt Lake in Nevada. I mean, there's, there's other examples, but those are the two that people tend to know. Um, saline water is good old seawater, all right? And that comes in from 30 to 50 parts per thousand. Brackish, and I think I used these incorrectly when I was younger. Brackish is actually, you know, like half fresh. 
Brackish is close to the coast. Brackish is the, uh, the continental water coming in uh, and the, the ocean water coming, well, the continental water going out and the ocean water coming in and they mix together. And then way down at the bottom, we're talking about that fresh water there with less than 0.5 parts per thousand. And back to the analogy, okay, that's that last little sip that's left in your bottle that you maybe even look twice at before you, you drink it. Just a tiny little bit of water. And the font is way too small for you to read it, but it says ponds, lakes, rivers, streams and aquifers. So now think about all the rivers and streams that you've seen or learned about and all the lakes and ponds that you've memorized the names of or visited and then all the groundwater you can't see. And then maybe that helps you get an appreciation for how much water is everywhere else because that's a lot of water if you stop and think about it. Not with regard to people, but, you know, we've come across a lot of water out there. But it's not enough to not feed us all. Water us sounds weird, though. But it's not enough to water us all. Okay, now, finally, the hydrologic cycle. I do want you to draw this. You learn while drawing but we don't necessarily need to take it to this level. There we go, zoom it in a little bit for you folks here in class. Um, you need, please for the, definitely for right now, ignore all these dang arrows, okay? You need some land sloping down, you need some little water off to the side, draw some nice little waves meeting it. You need a tree, you need a cloud, you need a sun. Take a moment and make that happen. So again, some land, some water, lapping up on it. A tree, a cloud, a sun. Great. So, like I said, we don't have to start over the oceans here, but think about how much ocean there is out there and how much of this process does occur over here. It's a, it's a great, it's a logical place to start. It's also a great point, uh, opportunity to remind you that um, when we're talking about evaporation, only water evaporates. In other words, if we're in the ocean, that's salt and whether it's sodium chloride or magnesium, this or that or the other thing, that stuff doesn't evaporate. And I only take a moment to point that out because desalinization is becoming more and more and more of a, a term that people are familiar with, okay, as a way, desalinization, removing the saline, the salt, as a way of making more fresh water. The sun does this every moment of every day that it's out there shining. All right. The problem is on our end of things, it is a very energy intensive um, procedure. All right. And simply waiting for the sun to do it might do well enough for you and your family and maybe a small village. But when we talk about large city-wide plants doing this, it's, it takes a lot of energy. So anywho, so out of this salt water, okay, just the water, the H2 and the O are taking the first step here. They're heated up by the sun and they turn from liquid into gas. And what do we call that process, you guys? You've known this word for a very long time. Evaporation, right? Evaporation is the phase change from liquid to gas. Now, as we go up into the atmosphere, uh, even though you're getting closer to the sun, it gets cooler. 
And as it gets cooler, um, the water molecules cool down themselves and they change from the gaseous state uh, to the liquid state. And that's another thing I really want to drive home, just a little bit of misinformation that sometimes you make it this far in life um, believing. Clouds are not made up of water vapor, okay? Clouds are made up of liquid water or ice. There's a phase change, and that is so vitally important because one of the things we don't talk about in here because it's not a weather class is there's an energy transfer going on. All right, latent heat. You may have heard of that word. You might remember that word. And um, when we change these phases, this energy is transferred, and that's a large part of what drives these weather systems. Okay, so we have to have that phase change. And that's not why clouds aren't gas. They just they just aren't gas. But that's a, a great example of, of you know why it's important to know that. So anywho, what do we call that uh, phase change where we go from gas to liquid? Condensation. Excellent. So the water vapor condenses um, into water droplets. And again, remember our opening slide: water loves to stick to other water. Okay. Um, so these water droplets get bigger and bigger and bigger. They <laughs> like to clump together, and eventually you've got this thing we know and love as a cloud. Happens to be a rather rainy day, at least a little little bit ago when we were all coming in. All right, clouds all over the place. But we've got a nice little happy fluffy cloud there right now in our drawing. If that's high enough, again, it would be made of ice crystals. Your low cloud water, liquid water. Anywho, through a handful of reasons, um, those clouds will move up in the move in the atmosphere. In this case we need it to go over the land. All right. At some point, even though we've just sort of removed ourselves from the water, we need to carry on this conversation a little further, that those water droplets keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And at some point, they are too heavy, for lack of a better word, um, to stay in the cloud. They're, um, the gravity of the little microgravity, if you want to call it that, of the cloud uh, is overcome by the gravity of the planet. There's a, there's a whole handful of different ways you can talk about it. Suffice it to say, the cloud starts falling apart. Okay, The sky is crying, all kinds of wonderful metaphors we have. Um, but that's literally what's happening. It's, the, the droplets eventually get too big and very, they fall. Gravity. We know that as precipitation. It's not a phase change though, okay? It's just the cloud tearing itself apart. Now again, what happens to that, that on the way down, whether it freezes, turns into snow, turns into ice, stays rain, that's another conversation for another class. Right now, we just need that precipitation to fall to the surface. Yeah. So is the evaporation of the sea strong and it condenses, then it can become drinkable water? In yeah, in theory. Uh, and, and there's a lot of uh, places that are working on that. They've got these cool little things. They it basically like tarps. They're nets, actually, not tarps that will catch the water as it evaporates up because uh, it leaves it leaves the salt behind. But it's just, again, it's, it's small scale stuff. Um, and it's not horribly fast. And that's why they tried to speed it up when they built factories and plants to do this. But the energy is insane. But yeah, that's you're making fresh water. And that's a great way, even if you have dirty water, it's a great way that it can get cleaned if you catch that fresh stuff that comes off. It leaves all the little bugs and critters and bacteria behind. They don't evaporate either. So we're over land now, and precipitation is happening. Uh, when that water falls on the surface of the earth, we generally say, and again, this is kind of generic, but we generally say that it has one of two options. It stays at the surface as runoff, or it percolates into the ground as groundwater. 
We've already had this semester the groundwater discussion. We know that the, the water, uh, when it's allowed to, again, when there's not pavement or blacktop or buildings in the way, um, the water will trickle down into the earth and fill up these aquifers that we know and love and utilize. And some of those arrows on there imply that, yeah, eventually that even makes its way. Everything goes downhill. Gravity, 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 right? But yeah, eventually some of that can go back down to the oceans and help start that process over again. It's hard to picture when you live really, really far away from the oceans, though. So it kind of gets into these little micro cycles, these local water cycles, if you would. Anywho, so that's the groundwater. The other one, runoff, well, that's your streams and your lakes. And we haven't talked about that this semester, and we might not talk about it this semester. But that channels water around at the surface. Again, in this diagram, it moves downhill and eventually works its way back to the sea. There's a handful of major rivers that do that. You guys are familiar with a couple of them, I'm sure. But more so, a lot of it tends to stay local or regional, if you would. Talk about regional water cycles. You're driving around on the big highways, you might see signs for entering one watershed, leaving another watershed. There's one or two of them on 90. So again, runoff and groundwater aren't phase changes either, but they are important steps here. So let's talk about our little tree that we bothered to draw here. And why did we draw the tree? Well, you guys know that trees drink water, and, uh, and any green plant for that, well, any plant for that matter, it doesn't have to be a green plant, but most of them are, um, through their roots and they're using groundwater and so on and so forth. And uh, you've probably heard that cutting down forests is really bad. Uh, for a couple of reasons, um, but water cycle is is certainly one of them. But we see the word transpiration above that there, and that is uh, a term for us here. And uh, oftentimes, I'm not sure, and I apologize, I should know exactly what, what term your text uses. Uh, they change things with additions, and, and it's hard to keep up with that kind of stuff. Sometimes you'll see the word evapo in front of it, evapotranspiration, okay? For the most part, we've all dropped it because it's kind of redundant. Because what we'll tell you is that transpiration is a special kind of evaporation that green leafy matter does. So to say evaporation, special evaporation is, as I said, redundant. So transpiration. Um, Remember photosynthesis? Or at least you know it exists. Right? We don't have to worry about the formula in here. But we know it happens. And that gas exchange happens through tiny little holes that open and close on the leaves. You can't even see them. They're super tiny, but they're there. And they open up to let the CO2 in and let the O2 out. Well, while that's happening, some water vapor leaves as well. Actually a sizable amount of water vapor leaves. They leave that out of the formula because it's, uh, well, it, it, H2O is in the formula, don't get me wrong, but it hardly ever comes up in discussion uh, that I'm aware of as part of the water cycle at any rate. But it is happening, and again, when you have a large, large forest and we talk about these localized water cycles, it can be a big part of it. So again, transpiration just a special kind of evaporation that happens through green leafy matter. All right. So we've got evaporation, we've got condensation, we've got transpiration. Um, there's actually a few more phase changes uh, that we haven't mentioned yet. We got a really, really, really technical term here. Uh, what do we call the phase change from solid to um, liquid? Yeah, 
No, I was teasing about it being very fancy, so Mel thinks we're fine. <laughs> yeah. No, it's nice when we have like a normal word, isn't it? Um, yeah, just melting works. I'm sure somebody somewhere had liquefaction, liquefaction. I, but no, I think melting is, is sufficient here. Uh, it, it is a hard one, though. How about solid to gas? That one's in the recesses of your brain. Hmm? Anybody else? I know some of you have had this stuff. Gas, I'm sorry, solid to gas. Gas to solid. All right, sublimation. Sublimation, S-U-B-L-I-M. You'll see all these summarized in a minute. But So we don't have one in this diagram, but if you had an ice sheet, if you had a glacier, okay, and um, the sunlight was hitting that and melting it for that day and, and, and you're going to get some evaporation. No, we don't call it that. If it's ice straight to gas, it's called sublimation. Now, I did mention that the opposite of that happens as well. Gas to solid, skips liquid in the middle. That's just called deposition. Same spelling as when we used it with weathering and erosion. But, and this is just a personal hypothesis, I've never really Googled it, Frost, all right, can get really, really intricate. You guys, we have such awesome windows nowadays. When I was growing up, some of the older houses still had these really crummy windows, um, and you'd get the, uh, the 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 frost forming on the inside of it, and it'd be these cool feathery looking effects, and so on and so forth. Um, sometimes you'll see it outside on leaves and grass. Well, that's only possible because when you go from the gaseous state to the um, solid state straight through, you're working with, to, to borrow a, a modern term, all right, you're working with pixels that are way tinier. Water droplets are huge compared to these, these gas droplets. Not really the right word, but you know what I'm saying. Um, so that's, I think, why... You know, frost looks so much cooler than just ice. It's just smaller little pixels that they're painting with, so to speak. So ice, which is in our water cycle, we've got sublimation, we've got melting, and that melt can also evaporate. Um, I think we've hit everything. Again, we'll see when we get to our little summary sheet here in a minute. And it just goes back around and back around and up through. And the point is, is that this is a closed system, okay? Short of the little bits of uh, water that, that, that dribble down on us uh, from tiny bits of comets coming in here and there. We have all the water we're ever going to have and all the water that we have had for a very, very, very long time, all right? And that's why it's important. You don't hear it so often anymore, but um, again, in the 70s and 80s, you know, conserve water, conserve water. Um, and uh, it, it's, you know, shut off the water while you're brushing your teeth kind of thing. Don't let it run while you're doing the dishes, which I'm very, very guilty of. Um, you're supposed to shut it on and off each time, and I'm too lazy for that. Um, you know, there is only so much water. Now, I know that it's going right down the drain, and that drain's going to the water treatment plant, and that water treatment plant's going to put it right back into the system, and it may not be me that gets those water droplets the next day, but somebody's going to get them. Again, that's a closed system as well-ish. So, um, but in many, many, many parts of the world, okay, and from that bigger picture, that bigger perspective, uh, conservation is, is incredibly important. So again, our phase changes, the three states or phases of matter. We're not going to worry about plasma in this one. All right. Uh, but when we move from one to one, we do call that a phase change. So let's just review and make sure we did get them all. Solid to liquid, we said, was melting. We didn't talk about liquid to solid. What's that called? 
Breathing, good. Liquid to gas. Starts with an E. Evapo, yeah, gas to liquid. Starts with a C. Condensation. Solid to gas, that's the new hard one. Sublimation, good. Gas to solid. Deposition, good. That's like, what, two, four, six questions right there on the next test. Please don't miss them. Especially since you've known most of them since third grade. And then our friend evapotranspiration down there at the bottom. Which is a special kind of evaporation that only green leaky matter does. Huh? During, yeah, while photosynthesis is happening. Yeah, it is not the same thing. It is a uh, an ancillary process, as they say. It's happening along the side. It's happening at the same time. So just kind of going back through what we've been talking about. So we've got water in the air. We're talking about water vapor, all right, uh, that does change to liquid or solid, don't get me wrong, but when we're talking about water in the air, we, we usually talk about water vapor. One word I haven't used yet is condensation nuclei, and it's really important when we're talking about cloud formation, all right, because while water does love to stick to other water, it, it, it really likes to have something to get the ball rolling. And condensation nuclei are just that. Usually they're little particles of dust um, or they could be salts if you're over an oceanic area or unfortunately sometimes it could be something that comes out of a smokestack. This is why we have acid rain. This is how we have acid rain. It's particles of sulfur or whatnot that are floating around in the atmosphere uh, coming out of a coal plant for example can act as condensation nuclei and you get that little bit of sulfur then with every water drop and that builds up and you get just the right combinations it turns into a weak form of sulfuric acid. Nitric acid is another one that can form with little nitrogen particles and so on and so forth. So, um, so condensation nuclei are very important in a, in a couple of tangential conversations but uh, cloud formation would not be possible uh, without it. And that kind of cycles back to, if we're to believe the news hype, um, that's essentially what cloud seeding is. Um, I want to say they use silver nitrate, but don't quote me on that one. Um, is basically they're providing a lot of condensation nuclei for what water vapor is there. And that's the main reason I don't uh, fully believe the, blaming this on the, the mad scientists out there trying to seed the clouds. You got to have precipitation, not precipitation. You have to have water vapor there in the first place to for the seeds to do any good. So they already had a huge amount of moisture there. I, if anything, it was just bad timing, okay? Or you know somebody forgot to carry the one and just did some bad math, um, didn't realize how much water vapor they had. But um, so that's why cloud seeding hardly ever works, you got to have the, the, the moisture in the air in the first place. Anyhow, not to sidetrack again, but um, so water in the air starts as water vapor ends up as precipitation, okay. Falls back down to the surface, where again we talk about two things. We talk about runoff at the surface, or we talk about it percolating into the ground. Uh, word infiltration, haven't really used that. Uh, Formally, uh, but it's shown up in a slide or two, I'm sure. Uh, and we talk about groundwater in that case. All right, aquifers, your surface water, streams and lakes. Yes, of course, ponds and puddles. We only have so much room on each slide. And lastly, not to forget, we've got the glaciers and or the ice sheets also with water at the surface. Ice sheets can be on land or just on the open ocean. And a big difference, again, when we're worrying about them melting. 
South Pole. You got land there, Antarctica. Ice on that melts. It goes into the water. Sea level goes up. North Pole, no land. Ice is already floating. How many times has your drink overflowed because the ice in it melted? Never, okay? Not saying it's bad. Not, not saying it's not bad that it's melting. Don't get me wrong. But that's not the stuff they're talking about for sea level rise. It's the ice that's on the land that's the, the worrisome stuff. And don't be mistaken, it is melting up north a lot. A few years back, they tried to startle us with the polar bears drowning because they couldn't swim from iceberg to iceberg anymore. All right, that didn't really work uh, too well. Not a whole lot, you know, the average person can do that cares about polar bears anyhow. But, so now, uh, NNA navigating the new Arctic. I, I, it's melting so much that businesses have taken note and they're saying, hey, we could save a whole hell of a lot of gas by not going around North America and just going over the top now. They can get ships through almost, I think, 365 now. Um, in, in some parts, it's just that melted. Um, so it is, it is happening. Okay. All right. And that, my friends, is um, the water cycle. Again, hopefully a good bit more um, than you got the last time you heard about it. I try to bring in other aspects of things uh, that are related, okay? And that we don't necessarily get an opportunity to talk about uh, in a direct uh, chapter in this class, but are definitely uh, important and or related. So that should have been the context that I gave you for this as a setup for groundwater. All right. Um, I need to check and see how quickly I can do glaciers. And I'll basically check that by looking at uh, some of my lectures from previous semesters. If I could do glaciers in one or one and a half lectures, uh, we can still get a little bit of streams in. Okay, I know you guys are super excited, but um, so point being, whether or not in our two remaining lectures, three, no, two, because the t test is on a Tuesday this semester, um, in our two remaining lectures, whether we can do glaciers in the Ice Age and a little bit of streams or just glaciers in the Ice Age. So. Uh, to be announced soon, Tuesday, when we walk into the classroom. And you would think that such a dire predicament like that would cause me to continue on lecturing today. <laughs>